tell us about yourself. What are you, what were you, and what qualifies you to talk about this? Yeah, so I am a former third generation Seventh-day Adventist. I was and raised, my dad is a pastor in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I was educated in Seventh-day Adventist institutions. Um, I have read thousands of pages of the pioneers, ranging from Ellen White to Joseph Bates, Jan Andrews, you name it. Um, I was very plugged into the culture. Um, that doesn't mean that I know everything or that I'm above correction, but um, just a little bit about my involvement with this. I'm not some rogue guy who just decided to, um, I had an ax to grind with this random movement. You know, I didn't go out in the woods and, you know, say, God, tell me what you want me to do type thing. Mm -hmm. um, I have a, a long lineage with this um, cult. Uh, I was, like I said, raised in it. Um, I walked away for a number of years, fell into the deception of Eastern religions for a stint of time, and God radically saved me out of that. Uh, upon being regenerated, I had an urge or an inkling based on my tradition to go back to Seventh-day Adventism. So I did that for a brief stint, and through reading scripture now with the Holy Spirit and uh, actually being a Christian, <laughs> uh, it became very clear very quickly that what I was taught to believe growing up is not Christianity, though the language is the same, the dictionary is not. Mm -hmm. And so that was kind of my journey in um, realizing that this movement is dangerous, that it is false. Um, and I was non-denominational for a period. Um, I know that some people in your audience won't like this, and that's fine. I'm a reform guy, um, sure. but I'm not a uh, like a hyper, uh, if you're a Trinitarian, we can have in-house discussions on the other stuff. I came out of that. So that's why I, I've said it. I'm not too fond, not, not, not saying you, because I came out of that system, five points of Calvinism. I may be yeah. a little harsh on certain people, but no, I've said it. There are true believers born of the spirit that God is working in and through. And that's my prayer for you now. Well, I'm not a Calvinist Baptist either, by the way. I'm, you're what? I'm, an, I'm not a Calvinist Baptist either. Um, I'm a, uh, I'd say like a classical Protestant. All right. So, so like a, I'm, you say you go to Pres a, Pres I'm Presbyterian. a Presbyterian. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Just was curious. Cause uh, I just say that cause, cause Calvinist Baptists are, are, uh, yeah, I, I love, I love Reformed Baptists. Um, I have lots of friends that are Reformed Baptists, but we have very different views in, in yes. a lot of areas, um, especially when it comes to tradition. So precisely, especially, uh, pedo baptism. <clears throat> You're yes. in love with Luther, but, that's why it was good to clarify because you said you used to go to non-denominational churches. But yeah. I want to hear this part. And guys, I'm not as young as this man. May God give me the strength and vigor of my youth so my throat stays perfectly healthy and strong. I'm getting old. But I want people to hear what you said. You said your pastor, sorry, your father is a pastor or was or still is? Because you said your father was a pastor in this church. Is. 40 plus years. He still is, huh? Yep. Man, so he must think you betrayed him, huh? Uh, we've had, I mean, I, so I left Adventism, for those that are curious, uh, over a decade ago. So this isn't like a, you know, fresh blood, I'm like hyped up type thing. Um, mm -hmm. I actually wanted to start my YouTube channel for quite some time, prayerfully considered it, talked with my elders, that type of thing. Um, but yeah, my dad, my dad's still a pastor in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And yeah. since it's been as long as it has, we've obviously had these discussions. Um, we're cordial about the differences, um, but honest. Uh, it's not something, obviously, that we bring up like every time that we're together. But, um, it, you know, I, I, I pray that the triune God will um, draw him to himself. Glory to God, Father, Son, and Spirit. That's our prayer. So <clears throat> in Seventh-day Adventism, do they do like what Joe's Witnesses do, this fellowship? Because obviously he's still talking to you. Yeah. So you still have good relations. But in some of these cults, <clears throat> like the Joe's Witnesses, they disfellowship you where family members have to cut off all ties and cannot communicate. Do you have something like that in the Seventh Day Adventist movement? As you answer that question, you're going to open the door for the cat. So yeah, no worries. Um, no, not officially. It's not to say that there may not be people out there or pockets of people, because just like any of these other movements, you've got splintering now. You've got small pockets of people that think all sorts of things. So I'm only familiar with the American version. One thing I think people should really know and grasp about this cult is that they are in 200 plus countries. This isn't like Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons, which tend to be all congregated predominantly in America um, or a few other places. This is a uh, th this cult has spread at like a, a parasite all over the world. And yeah. so I don't know about in some of these other pockets, 
Um, but unlike the Jehovah's Witnesses, um, no, they don't have a like an official doctrine around disfellowship. Though I will say that um, while they may not follow through with the you know the formalities of of all of that, um, they will definitely tell. I mean, people like me, I basically in order to be saved, I'd have to come back groveling on my hands and knees because Absolutely. I've been I've been given light that the rest of you have not. And I've walked away from that. And so they like to use the arc analogy, kind of like your Orthodox audience would similarly use. Um, they would say that I left the arc and my only hope is to get back on the arc. Hmm. I see. There's another segment of Adventism that's now spreading that are Aryan, anti-Trinitarian. Yeah, we're, we're going to talk about them tonight. Good. All right. So now, because that comes up because I've seen one person in particular, he's a Persian background. Nader Munzer. Yep. Very adamant and showing that the roots of Adventism is Aryan, not Trinitarian. Now he's correct, back, by the way. He is, huh? All right. Yeah. So he, he is in line with actual consistent historic Seventh Adventism. Okay. Now, guys, this is where he's going to unpack. He's going to tell you the true roots of Adventism, what they believe. So now give us history that started with Adventism and then Ellen G. White, when she came into the picture. Yep. What is Adventism? When did it start? What were their core beliefs? Yep. So <clears throat> if you want, um, if you, I'll do whatever it. you want to do it, you want to put up slides, cool. whatever I'm here. You, you lead. I just, I just want per to remember perfect. A lot of people have no idea what Adventism is. Yep. We're going to get into everything that people need to know. And I think it'd be good to say, like you talked about before yeah. the session went live, this may end up being two parts. We're not going to yeah. rush through this. We are going to go very deep. I know that your audience, I've watched enough of you, Sam, and inter interacted with your audience. I know that your audience can handle the length and the meat of these things. So I want to really unpack that stuff. Sure, um, exactly. The things that we talked about is, of course, Ellen White, because all of their people have to understand she is the fountainhead for this movement. So think Joseph Smith, Mormons, Charles Russell, Jehovah's Witnesses, Ellen G. White, Seventh Adventism. Same, same thing. You have to understand the role that that individual plays. Um, we are then going to get into very quickly what's called the great controversy paradigm. This is the other thing that, that, that's linked with Ellen White that you also have to understand. And you'll see why when we get into that. But then we're going to break into three primary things. The Trinity. Deity of deity, or person and, and nature of Christ, essentially. Investigative judgment which includes in it the wicked demonic scapegoat doctrine. Yeah. So we're going to unpack all of that. I'll give you the cliff notes historically. They were born out of the Millerite movement. The Millerite movement was a fanatical group of people in the late or mid rather 1900s, uh, or sorry, the 19th century, 1800s. 1835, uh, roughly to 1844, was the Millerite movement. Miller came up with this crazy hermeneutic <laughs> where he basically started putting a bunch of numbers together and turned all these numbers into time prophecies. We don't have time to get into all that. We could probably do an entire show on that sometime if you wanted, the Miller chart. Because in order for all this other kooky theology to be true, the rest of this Miller chart actually has to be true, and they never discuss that part. But either way, he came up with all these crazy dates, and essentially said that Christ was going to return in uh, 1843. When that didn't happen, it shifted to 1844. Specifically, in the spring of 1844, a guy by the name of Samuel Snow came up with the specific date of October 22nd, 1844. This is important to understand. This date is a hinge for this movement. October 22nd, 1844 came and went. Jesus obviously did not return. At that point, most of these Millerites went back to whatever. This was a ecumenical movement. They were coming from being Methodists and Lutherans. It was a, a, a Protestant ecumenical movement. Most of these people just went back to their previous movements, including William Miller, who was a Baptist prior to the Millerite Adventist movement. But Adventism in general was birthed out of this. Your Jehovah's Witnesses came out of this movement. They were initially called the First Day Adventists in conjunction or contrast to the Seventh Day Adventists. Another discussion again for another time. However, not all people went back to these other groups that they came from. There was a group that came out of this that called themselves initially the Little Flock. This was a small band of Millerites 
who refused to accept that 1844 was a disappointment. So historically, and there's lots of information on this if people want to look into it, it's called the Great Disappointment. This was a crazy time. People were killing themselves. People didn't harvest their crops. They gave their homes away. People were convinced that this was happening. Do it. You can do digging on the psych wards at that time. They were busting at the seams because these people were devastated. There was a small group, this little flock, who refused to accept they were wrong. Ellen Harmon, as her maiden name was, was a part of this fanatical group. She was a 17-year-old at the time. So these, she was young. There was an, uh, another handful of people, obviously, in this movement. One of them, his name was Hiram Edson. The day after the Great Disappointment, so October 23rd, 1844, he was walking to meet with this band of, or some of this band of the little flock. On his walk over there, he's walking through a cornfield. And supposedly, the heavens opened up in vision to him. And he said that he saw that Jesus was not returning to the earth on October 22nd, 1844. He was actually entering into the most holy place in the heavenly sanctuary for the first time. So that he said, we weren't wrong. It was revealed to him, he said, they weren't wrong about the date. They were wrong about the event and location. Miller thought Jesus was returning to the earth and they used Daniel 8.14 to justify this. This is their foundational text. That after 2300 evenings and mornings, which they say is days, Christ, the sanctuary will be cleansed. Miller was getting these numbers based off, a lot of it based off of this and said the earth was the sanctuary. This guy, Hiram Edson, said, no, 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 no. It clearly wasn't talking about the earth. And because the earthly sanctuary is not standing anymore in 1844, it has to be the heavenly sanctuary. Mm. So I know this sounds convoluted because it is, but it's key to understand this because this is the first domino. This man, Hiram Edson, then talked and spoke with a guy by the name of O.R.L. Crozier. They discussed this, this doctrine, which was not deemed to the investigative judgment right at that moment. But they discussed this doctrine, and he wrote down his six primary points that he was revealed, or, or, or like they, they arrived at with this. It's that the atonement did not even, they've shifted on this, but this is originally what was being said. The atonement did not even take place on the cross. Hmm. The atonement has to take place in heaven. This portion continues in the doctrine today. Either way, it was a bunch of convoluted nonsense. This guy, O.R.L. Crozier, then went and took this, what this essentially his meeting with um, Hiram Edson and wrote this down and then submitted it into an Adventist paper at the time called the Day Star Extra. That's where the first publication of this idea of the deception was actually or the, the false prophecy was actually not false. It was just we were wrong about the location and the event. As time goes on and they continue trying to work through this idea and not accept that they are wrong, a Ellen Harmon, Ellen G. White, has her first vision, supposedly, December 1844, three months after the Great Disappointment. Hmm. It's in this that she is supposedly given confirmation about this. This is what you can read about in the book Early Writings. We are going to look at some of that tonight, and I, and and you you'll see. But essentially, that's where this was supposedly confirmed. People need to understand this about Ellen White. Ellen White did not originate any doctrines in the Seventh Day Adventist Church. We're going to get to a quote a little bit. Um, after we get into the, the foundations for Ellen White here. Um, but just to preface, the way that it worked, she was the conduit that was supposedly being used. You can read about this in early writings. I believe it starts on page 76. And by the way, all of her writings are online for free, egwwritings.org. So if you want to open up the app tonight on a different tab and you want to fact check this, I'm going to be giving, folks, we're going to be receipts for days. And I'm going to be telling you what each one is. So if you want to put it in on there, it will pop right up for you. I've got the online codes that I will also be reading. So you just need to understand she did not originate any doctrines in this church. The way that she, it worked was they, were, they would be sitting in a room studying the Bible. This group of, 
of this little flock. The men would essentially be doing this. She, by her own admission, said that she could not understand anything that was being said. She said that she was dull of hearing. Hmm. They would just be studying the Bible and it was all going over her head. She had no clue what was being said. But then when they would, when they would arrive at a roadblock or a disagreement that they weren't able to agree upon or uh, essentially say this is the correct interpretation, <laughs> Ellen would supposedly go into trances, aka visions, and the correct interpretation would be shown to her. And then she would tell them, and that was the stamp of approval, cementing it in. That's the way she worked. So Joseph Bates, for example, he was the oldest guy in this movement. He honestly, if it wasn't for Joseph Bates, the movement probably would not have survived. They were all young, like 17 through 24. Joseph Bates was the only grown individual out of this whole movement. But for example, it was Joseph Bates who actually presented the Sabbath teaching. They weren't originally Seventh-day. That's why they weren't Seventh-day Adventists. The doctrine around the Sabbath, which is the primary focus now, um, that wasn't even around originally. The original thing from 1844 to roughly eight, the around early to mid 1850s, the focus was around what was called the shut door and the investigative judgment. I've heard a guy, you, you probably don't remember this because you talked to tons of people, but you have some videos with some, some Adventists from like, yeah, two, about, two, yeah. two, from like two or three years, two or three years ago. And there's one, bless this poor man, I hope that God has, he seemed genuine. I hope that God has worked on him. I think his, uh, his username was Quick Thinking. Mm. And he tried to use this, they love to use the bridegroom of Matthew 22 oh. um, to say it's yeah. talking about the investigative judgment and the, the shut door. But anyways, that was basically how Ellen White essentially functioned and worked. So with all of that said, now let's get into the key things. I'm going Let me to ask you one more. Okay, you know go for it. Yep. Yes, you're saying originally the Sabbath wasn't the issue, right? That's what you said? Nope. That was something that, the, so that you'll, we'll talk about this tonight as well. Yes. They have a term called present truth. And that it's essentially what all these cults use. They say that it's essentially light that was not revealed to the church previously that has been specifically given to them to then reveal to everyone else. So they're, they're, historical revisionism man is just it's ridiculous because the idea behind it is kind of like no one knew about the sabbath and then god revealed this light to them and it's their duty now to take this to the rest of the world but at the same time it initially snowballed because a seventh-day baptist gave them a tract on the sabbath and that was like the linchpin that initially started this whole discussion so if you were given a tract by somebody else who had the, that same idea Obviously, other people understood this supposedly. So it's just ridiculous. But no, the Sabbath was not the original thing because they were not the Seventh Day Adventists yet. Okay. They were the little flock. They became officially Seventh Day Adventists in 1863, which is when they were incorporated as a denomination. That's the date that they love to point to and try and skip 44 to 63. Because they don't want you looking into those years because what you're going to find, and we're going to look, like I said, what you're going to find is a bunch of quackery, a bunch of anti-Trinitarian heresy, a bunch of 4th, 5th century heresies that people have, the church has buried long ago. These people are just resurrecting. They're literally just a buffet of heresies, dude. You're going to see. You're, we're going to see. So any other questions? No, that, this is clear. So just, um, so William Miller went back to the Baptist church. Correct. He still believed in the imminent return of Christ, which is what Adventism was really about. It, you have to understand, too, the period of time and the place that this movement existed. They are still stuck in this mindset today, by the way. Um, they originated in the burned-over district, like Mormonism, Jehovah's Witnesses, in the northeastern peninsula of the United States in the mid-1800s. What was around the zeitgeist of that day prior to the, the stuff that was going on around there with Millerism and stuff was influenced by the previous generation, which was my spiritual ancestors, the Covenanters, Dutch Reformed, the, the Puritans fleeing England from Anglicanism. They were post-millennial. They had a post-millennial, almost theonomic um idea of theology that really influenced that region of the country 
So they were a movement springing up at that time. So it was contrary to what we see today, where I would argue the most Western professing Christians, by Western I mean American, are premillennial, you know, exactly. maybe imminent return of Christ type. That was not always the case in this country. Okay. There was a period where the postmillennial idea was the majority due to the Puritan and Covenanter Dutch Reformed influence. So that was the period of the or the time and the, the location of the country that they were rising up in, which is, in my estimate and hypothesis, the reason why it seems so captivating to so many people. Jesus is coming at any moment in comparison to, again, a more longer viewed timeline like the post -monialist. So, yeah, that Mil Miller retained being an Adventist and went back to the Baptist church and essentially stopped his date setting. I believe he repented of it. Hopefully he got right with the Lord and um, repented of all this damage that he has essentially caused as a scourge on the church. Yes, exactly. In fact, it's ironic. He said little flock, little flock. That's also in Jehovah witness theology. Right? Yep. Correct. So Wait, I'm going to be doing some, I'm going to be doing some content on that. Two apples from the, from the same tree series. Yeah where we're going to talk about all this because Good. Michael, Michael, the archangel, just all the, the parallels. Yep. So however you want to proceed, brother, I'm right here. So if you want all right. to go ahead. Yep. So we're going to start with the fundamental beliefs. So their church, they will be quick to condemn creeds. You're going to see this very quickly. They will be quick to condemn the creeds as being Roman Catholic Pope, popery and a bunch of paganism and stuff from the dark age, just all sorts of Aristotelian thought, all these excuses that they give. This is because obviously Ellen White and the pioneers were not in lockstep with that. The original founders of this movement, real quick before we get into the Ellen White thing, this is also important to understand as a foundation. And we're going to see again some of this more in detail tonight. Their pioneers were Arians and semi-Arians. If you want, look up James White, Ellen's future husband. Wait, Jay and her husband's name was James White? Alpha and Omega Ministries, I know. Did you guys Man. catch it? Ellen G. White's husband's name was James White, but that James White followed the belief of Arius, who believed Jesus is first creature. So there was a James White who was anti-Trinitarian. <gasps> <laughs> so... They, there was a mix of semi-Aryans and, Ar and full-blown Aryans. You had people like Uriah Smith, full-blown Aryan heretic. James White, semi-Aryan heretic. James White and a couple of the others came from what was called the Christian Connection. It was a loudmouth, Socinian-type group, which also then permeated the Seventh-day Adventists because, for example, they completely bastardized the idea of Sola Scriptura. They're the result of what happens when you don't actually understand history, what that phrase was in response to. It has nothing to do with saying tradition has no place. It's just me and my Bible. That's not what's being said. What's being said is that the scripture is the only infallible rule of faith that we have, and that tradition has to be subservient to that in contrast to um, you know, the, the Rome, Rome's position. They had the Socinian idea of Bible only, not Sola Scriptura. That's how they interpret it. What they mean by that is we just sat down with the Bible, this group of us, and we came to these conclusions, and then God gave his stamp of approval through this woman, etc. So they're not Sola Scriptura, but they will try to tell you that. And this guy, Raphael, is exactly correct. I believe he's actually Orthodox now. God bless you, brother. Um, he's a former Seventh-day Adventist. He says, Andrews University, the SDA flagship seminary, was named after Jan Andrews, an anti-Trinitarian and the first missionary to Europe. That is exactly correct. In Berrien Springs, Michigan, Andrews University, of which we're going to read from the chair of church history at Andrews University tonight, as well as Merlin Burt, who's also got a PhD and is at Andrews. So we're not going, Adventists, we're not just going to be talking about hearsay. We're going to go to your own scholars. We're going to go to your own sources. And people are going to see that this movement was not started by God. God was not behind this Aryan her heresy of a bunch of fanaticism and craziness. So <clears throat> keep that in mind. These pioneers were full-blown Aryan heretics. There's no way the Spirit of God was behind this. So we're going to read, oh yeah, yeah, the creeds. So they reject all the creeds and say they don't have any creed. We're the, they're the, we have one creed and it's the Bible alone, which is a creed, but they do have a creed. It's called their 28 fundamental beliefs. 
What they mean by that is they, unlike the historic Christian creeds, which do not change, their fundamental beliefs change over time. They'll update the wording. They'll try to switch stuff around. The belief we're going to read right here, they actually did that about seven years ago. It's not that they don't but still believe what they previously said. There was just too much heat that was being put on them. So they had to change the wording so that there's plausible deniability. So we're going to read their fundamental belief number 18. You can go to this yourself if you want. I'll actually, if people want, I can put this in the chat, in the comments. So people can see, oh, nope, I can't comment on that. So it's fine. You can go adventist.org slash beliefs if you want to look at this. And this is fundamental belief number 18 titled the gift of prophecy. Quote, the scriptures testify that one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit is prophecy. This gift, catch this, is an identifying mark of the remnant church. And we believe it was manifested in the ministry of Ellen G. White. Her writings speak with prophetic authority and provide comfort, guidance, instruction, and correction to the church. So they use 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. It's even in one of the footnotes as a proof text for Ellen White. And her writings speak with prophetic authority. What it used to say up to about seven years ago was she is a continuing and authoritative source of truth. So in Seventh-day Adventism, you have two authorities, two, two sources of authority, Ellen White and the Bible. And you're going to see which one is of greater authority and which one is subservient to which. So, so that's their fundamental. Go ahead. Just so I can clarify so people understand what you said. When in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, it says all scriptures God breathe. They applied that to Ellen G. White and her writings. That is correct. Okay. It's it's used it's in the footnotes as one of the proof texts for fundamental belief number 18, which is not about scripture. Scripture is belief fundamental belief number one. And what's interesting about that is these folks want to try and play off as being Protestant when it's convenient. Oh no, 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 no. We're just like all other Protestant churches. No, no, no. They they actually think we're all apostates, that Protestants are actually following after the beast who they believe is Rome and just a whole a whole host of things. But the point being. In fundamental belief number one, it does not say scripture is the only authoritative source of truth. It says it is an authoritative source of truth. That's because Ellen is also an authoritative source of truth. But we're going to go one deeper. This is their statement of confidence in the writings of Ellen G. White. This gets issued regularly. It is regularly voted on every year at the annual council where the president of the worldwide Seventh-day Adventist Church speaks, and it is the leadership of the SDA Church that is there listening, and every year at this thing, they re-vote on, on what's called the Statement of Confidence in the Writings of Ellen G. White. This is from their own website, and this was the most recent one. It's actually at the general conference session that they do this, not the annual council, though they do mention it at annual council. The president of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, by the way, he's not like in Mormonism. He's not like a prophet or anything like that, but it is the highest position in their church. It is the front spokesperson. His name is Ted Wilson. I've done some content on my channel, so if you see content on the channel about Ted Wilson, that's who I am referring to. Speaking, not, not to cut you, speaking with, how influential is Doug Batchelor, real quickly? Very. <clears throat> so he, you have to understand the hierarchy and the way that this works. By the way, folks, if you want to just absolutely be blown away, I had him on my channel recently. Elsie Jr. Lorston, three-volume set, Hiding in Plain Sight, former seventh, training to be a Seventh-day Adventist pastor, was on the up and up in Jamaica, was going up the ranks, had the golden path paved for him. God radically opened his eyes to that this thing's a full-blown cult, and he was willing to, with his family and his wife, his wife who was born and raised Seventh-day Adventist, the number one denomination in Jamaica is Seventh-day Adventism. Just a heads up, they're the biggest denomination in Jamaica. He walked away from all that and has arguably given the most thorough burial service in the most easy to understand language. So I highly recommend that. Again, Hiding in Plain Sight, Elsie Lorston, if you're really interested in learning about this at an insanely granular level, three volumes. It's available on Amazon. He didn't tell me to say this, by the way. I just am fully endorsing this guy. And uh, there's a Kindle version on there as well. Um, but Doug Batchelor is, um, he, he, he's been in their church for a long time, obviously. There are some 
arguments around some people don't like him, some people do, but in terms of the organization, Doug has the public stamp of approval. To get the public stamp of approval from the organization to where they will platform you and pump you out, they will put you on 3ABN, that's their satellite channel, the Three Angels Broadcasting Network, which we're going to talk about the Three Angels tonight. The last guy that you had on, you mentioned that and you weren't, you guys didn't end up going into it, but that's like a key component to this um, great controversy and revelation interpretation. But um, either way, um, if you want to get that public stamp of approval, you have to adhere to the official teachings. So Doug Batchelor, he's not a theologian. He's not a scholar. He's not one of the guys that's going to be work that they're going to get to work on their SDA Bible commentary. For example, the new one that's coming out, they're going to go to their theologically branded individuals. Doug Batchelor is a salesman. Doug Batchelor is an incredible orator who is able to present this thing and package it as though it's this old, ancient... They, they honest, they, So they're essentially part of the restorationist churches. They think that they're restoring ancient Christianity. So they think what they believe is ancient Christianity. So paedo-baptism, that's not ancient. Lord's Day on Sunday, that's not ancient. Real presence of Christ, like the presence of Christ in the Eucharist, not ancient. So anyways, that just goes to show you the lies that they're willing to tell. And folks, if you're curious about that, the guy I just mentioned, as well as CMB, the ambassador, they both have YouTube channels. I just had both of them onto my channel for a two part. It was five hours in total of refuting Doug's sales pitch of answering facts and fables of Seventh-day Adventism. It was a presentation that he was giving to a mixed audience. It is the perfect example of what you're going to hear as the public display of here's all we believe. And you can watch that in all five hours of it. And you can see um, us break down all of that stuff. But yeah, Doug is, Doug is a very big name. Obviously, Amazing Facts is an independent ministry. It's not actually affiliated with the Seventh Day Adventist Church, but it has the stamp of approval. And Doug is put up on t uh, like TBN, he, which isn't Adventist, but he's platformed there. They blast out Amazing Facts stuff. So yeah, very, very influential guy. But I want to read to you here the statement of confidence in the writings of Ellen G. White. This is the most recent one. You can find this. You can just go on Google and type in statement of confidence in the writings of Ellen G. White, and it's on their official site, Adventist.org. On the centennial of her death, we rejoice that her writings have been made available around the globe in many languages and in a variety of printed and electronic formats. We reaffirm our conviction that her writings are divinely inspired, truly Christ-centered, and Bible-based. Rather than replacing the Bible... They uplift the normative character of scripture and correct inaccurate interpretations of it derived from tradition, human reason, personal experience, and modern culture. Close quote. So Roman Catholics out there, the, the best analogy that I can give you, Ellen is the magisterium of Seventh Adventism. There's not a holy see. They'll dog on that. They'll say that that's all, they'll, their anti-Catholic rhetoric will seep through and bleed through in their vitriol, and yet they're hypocrites because they have the exact same thing. So don't let them dog on you and try and demean you and tell you that you're a pagan and that you worship the sun and all this nonsense. Don't fall for it. Don't fall for it. In other Sorry, words... brother, I, I get worked up on this I, because oh, no, this, this, and this, uh, this, you study church history, man, after these people have lied to you and so, you hear uh, all the, they will they will they're standing on the shoulders of giants spitting on the shoulders that they're standing on. They, they'll tell you Justin Martyr was a pagan. They'll tell you Athanasius was a pagan. They'll tell you uh, Cyprian, Ambrose, Augustine. All these people were pagans. It, it's just crazy, man, to to just to make ahead. one point. Uh, two things real quickly, guys. He's confirming a lot what I said. I did an interview with Full Armor Apologetics. God willing, we'll upload it. I want you to go to his channel, watch it <clears throat> about the early church in the Bible <clears throat> and the tension <clears throat> that arises from those who are restorationists, because I mentioned this. But second thing I want you to note, the very people who decry a magisterium have their own magisterium that's replaced let's say the Catholic magisterium or the Orthodox magisterium. Yes. So that's what he's trying to tell you. Don't believe the lie 
they have their own magisteriums that they want you to fo follow <clears throat> while they decry the idea of a magisterium. So keep that in mind. Well, go ahead, brother. Yeah, these this movement is the perfect example of doublespeak and hypocrisy in almost every turn. And it drives me crazy. Adventists, you need to stop it. You guys are some of the worst most uninformed individuals about groups that you guys know nothing about. And for your audience, just so they know, they don't like Protestants like me anymore. They actually said that I'm worse than Catholics and Orthodox and the Assyrian Church of the East and the Coptic Church and the, the Mediterranean churches, etc. Because I was supposedly in the truth and then left, and now I joined the apostate Protestants in their mind. But um, Adventists, you need to stop it. You guys don't understand anything about church history because you're reading the great controversy and you're taking the great controversy as history. And it's just, it's not true. Now let's get into Ellen White's own words. After we have laid the foundation now, remember folks, the, what, remember what we just read. These words that we're now about to read are supposedly from God. They are divinely inspired. Sam, I need to cover one thing. Inspiration. You have to learn with this cult, they have gotten very good at definitions and redefining them, but using the right words. They know the right words to use. As you'll see tonight, they love to use the word Trinity. They are not Trinitarians, and we're going to show that, but that's just an example. Now, brother, I just want to encourage people again, two witnesses. He just confirmed. I didn't know he's going to say any of this. He didn't watch my session with Full Armor Apologetics. When you finish watching this, <clears throat> go to Full Armor Apologetics, watch my interview, and I'm going to try to upload it to my channel. I just said the same thing he said. We'll use the same terms, but not defined it the same way, but in a different context. So praise God, you're a second witness. Go ahead, brother. That's 100% true. Same vocabulary, different dictionary. And that's how they've been hiding in plain sight, because they look and appear like Protestants, and they're not. So... This is from, for those who are maybe following along and want to look up the sources themselves, this is from letter 92 from the year 1900. And if you're in the online library, the code is 3SM30.3. So that'll take you to essentially, in the letter, I'm not sure, but it's essentially paragraph 3. 3SM30.3. Quote, the Holy Ghost is the author of the scriptures and of the spirit of prophecy. These are not to be twisted and turned to mean what man want them to mean, to carry out man's ideas and sentiments, to carry forward man's schemes at all hazards. Close quote. The spirit of prophecy, the testimonies, are and, and the word that, like testimonies, those are the buzzwords that mean the writings of Ellen White. So they use the, the term from the book of Revelation, the spirit of prophecy, which is the testimony of Jesus. Sometimes they are referring to it in that in that they're saying it's just the Holy Spirit and the spirit of prophecy was active in all these prophets through the ages. And he then finally manifested and inspired Ellen White. But for the most part, if you're in Adventist circles, when you hear the phrase spirit of prophecy, it is referring to the summation of Ellen White's writings. So that's what she's saying here. The Holy Ghost is the author of the scriptures and of the spirit of prophecy. Second quote. Letters and Manuscripts, Volume 21, Letter 50, 1906. She died in 1915. So this is nine years prior to her death. The online code is 21 LTMS LT50 1906, paragraph or PAR 9. These ones are a little long when it's the letters and manuscripts. On that app, if you're doing it, Sam, you can actually type in phrases from the quote too, and it will populate. Quote I am thankful that the instruction contained in my books establishes present truth for this time. These books were written under the demonstration of the Holy Spirit, close quote. So present truth, when you hear them use that phrase, which this is their escape hatch for everything, it's truths which were not present in earlier times that God then led his people to discover, supposedly. So that's how that is defined. Another quote, Councils for the Church, page 92. Online code is CCH. 92.5, quote, I took the precious Bible and surrounded it with the several testimonies for the church. Given for the people of God, here said I, the cases of nearly all are met. The sins they are to shun are pointed out. The counsel that they desire can be found here. 
given for other cases situated similarly to themselves. God has been pleased to give you line upon line and precept upon precept. Close quote. Testimonies for the Church is a 10-volume set that she wrote. So this woman wrote thousands of pages, 10 times longer than the Bible. And yet you're supposed to read this in conjunction with Scripture. Man, you could dedicate your entire life to reading her writings and you'd struggle to make it all the way through. But that's how much this woman wrote. So she says here, the testimonies of the of, for the church are like a cloak that's wrapped around the Bible. The phrase that they will love to use is she's the lesser light that points to the greater light. Which is ridiculous because that's like, why do you need a flashlight in the sun? It doesn't make any sense at all. But they try to use that to say, um, that is correct. So there's CMB the ambassador. What up, Colin? Um, that's exactly correct. Ellen's cousin did marry Joseph Smith. Um, another story for another time. But this is the way that this woman functions. She is the infallible interpreter. That's the language they've used as well. I don't have that quote tonight, but I have a video on my channel where people can look at that for themselves if they want. Then she says, another quote, if you don't listen to her, the Holy Spirit is shut away from your soul. Selected Messages, Volume 1, page 46. 1SM 46.3. Quote, The testimonies of the Spirit of God are given to direct men to his word, which has been neglected. Now, if their messages are not, if these messages are not heeded, the Holy Spirit is shut away from the soul. What further means has God in reserve to reach the erring ones and show them their true condition? Close quote. Her writings express what God has given in vision. Quote, Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5, page 67. Code is 5T67.2. Quote, When I went to Colorado, I was so burdened for you that, in my weakness, I wrote many pages to be read at your camp meeting. Weak and trembling, I arose at three o'clock in the morning to write to you. God was speaking through clay. You might say that this communication was only a letter. Yes, it was a letter, but prompted by the Spirit of God to bring before your minds things that had been shown me. In these letters which I write, in the testimonies I bear, I am presenting to you that which the Lord has presented to me. I do not write one article in the paper expressing merely my own ideas. They are what God has opened before me in vision, the precious rays of light shining from the throne. Close quote. Adventists out there who want to do this Adventist light thing, Oh, I'm an Adventist, but I, I don't believe Ellen White. Guys, we try, We all tried that. We all tried that. It does not work. Do you believe these quotes? Do you believe your church's official statement in the confidence of these writings? Sam, we didn't talk on inspiration. You need to understand what they mean by inspiration. They don't believe in plenary verbal inspiration, that the words are inspired. They used to <clears throat> until a bombshell by Walter Ray you can get the book. It's called The White Lie. I have it in my library. Was dropped in the 80s. He started studying up on all the plagiarism. There were rumors going around that Ellen White was a plagiarist. Walter Ray, absolutely blow, sending a decimating blow to this movement, brought it to the attention of the leadership, was a pastor in their church. They didn't want to address it, essentially. He said, okay, well, if you're not going to cover it, I'm, I'm putting this out. I'm going to expose this then if you guys aren't willing to get honest with it and deal with it. It is a thorough examination. It has all the side by side showing all the works that she stole from. So this woman was a plagiarist. She was a liar. And yet all of this stuff is supposedly from the throne room of God. But they don't believe in plenary verbal inspiration. They now shifted after the white lie came out to what's called thought inspiration. So they shifted and said, well, no, 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 the words aren't inspired. And that was to deal with the fact that she stole words and plagiarized. The individuals are inspired and they use their own words to convey essentially the general idea that what God wanted to communicate. So it's still present. What God wanted to communicate is still present, but it's using human words 
the, the person's own words and the person can err because they're a human. So that's what they've used to, with along with present truth to get around her prop, her failed prophecies and just all sorts of other nonsense. So that's what they mean when they mean inspired. They don't mean the same thing that we mean. However, you just saw in the, the quote earlier that Ellen said that the author of her writings was the Holy Spirit along with the author of scripture. So either way, um, I digress. The people get the point you're making. She's claiming to be inspired, receiving revelation from the Holy Spirit to produce her writings equal to that of the Holy Bible. Did you guys catch it? The yep. writings are not inferior or secondary. They are equal to the Bible because she's just as inspired by the Spirit as the authors of Scripture. So guys, remember that. So go ahead, brother. Advent Adventists will have cognitive dissonance because they will try to tell you, we do not believe that because what they'll quickly go to say is, we don't believe she's an addition to the canon. Which, again, just kicks the can one step further down the road. It doesn't deal with the issue of, you're saying that the author of both is the same. That means they're equal. You can't have, and really it's not equal because, well, as I told you, they've stated that, and we just read the statement on of confidence in her writings. They correct any interpretation that doesn't align with her, which will be called tradition, human reason, etc. We've all watched it. We've all, we were all the former Adventists that I know. Every time we tried to bring this stuff up, be like, man, Ellen's interpretation on this doesn't seem to jive. No, you're silenced. That's not allowed. What Ellen said is the final. You're not going to argue that. It's case closed. So that's the way she functions. I don't care what they tell you. I don't care what they say. I was there. I experienced it. You're hearing the quotes for yourself now. I'm giving you all of the, the receipts yourself. They love to say you're taking her out of context. Okay, you go and look at them yourself and you tell me if you have basic reading comprehension or not. Here's how she supposedly received prophecy. Quote, this is from Gospel Workers, page 302. Code is 3SM31.4. Quote, at the time, this is after the 1844 disappointment, one error after another pressed in upon us. Ministers and doctors brought in new doctrines. We would search the scriptures with much prayer and the Holy Spirit would bring the truth to our minds. Some, some nights, or sorry, sometimes, Whole nights would be devoted to searching the scriptures and earnestly asking God for guidance. Companies of devoted men and women assembled for this purpose. The power of God would come upon me, and I was enabled clearly to define what is truth and what is error. As the points of our faith were thus established, our feet were placed on a solid foundation. We accepted the truth point by point, under the demonstration of the Holy Spirit. I would be taken off in vision and explanations would be given me. I was given illustrations of heavenly things and of the sanctuary so that we were placed where light was shining on us in clear, distinct ways. Close quote. She was given a vision of what again? Oh, dude, she claimed to have over 2,000 visions. She was personally taken to heaven multiple times. She claims to talk face-to-face -face with Jesus multiple times. We're going to get into all that. Now, the reason why I'm saying that is because you have another coward. See, they're only brave in the comment section. These cowards, these sons of the devil, he just said she never claimed the writing was equal to the Bible. Now, either you are a special kind of stupid and demonized, or you're not listening to what this daughter of Satan said. She had visions where she's taken into heaven, seeing the tabernacle, hearing from Jesus, and Holy Spirit inspired her. She's claiming to be equal to the Bible. Just because you want to worship this daughter of Satan doesn't mean <clears throat> we follow your denial. So stop barking and listen and repent. But go ahead, brother. Amen. She wrote not one heretical sentence, supposedly. This is from letter 329A three, from 1905. The code on this is 3SM52.2. Quote, I am, I am now looking over my diaries and copies of letters written for se from several years back. I have the most precious matter to reproduce and place before the Lord in testimony form. While I am able to do this work, the people must have things to revive past history, that they may see that there is one straight chain of truth without one heretical sentence in which I have written. This, I am instructed, is to be a living letter in to all in regard to my faith. Close quote. 
Here's her standard that she put forth. This is from Testimonies for the Church, five, and then it's a semicolon or a colon, 691. Quote, if the testimonies speak not according to the word of God, so remember, testimonies is, well, actually, in this case, she's speaking about the 10-volume set. Reject them. Christ and Belial cannot be united. Close quote. So tonight, we're going to test this theory. And by the end of it, you be the judge using her own standard. I'm going to read that again. If the testimonies speak not according to the word of God, reject them. Christ and Belial cannot be united. So all of that laying the foundation. That is what she herself says. The SDA church upholds these writings. You can listen. You need folks. You need to listen. If you want to hear about this, you need to listen to actual people who have that stamp of approval. Like I mentioned, you're going to find all these one-offs who want to say, no, 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 no. Listen to Doug Batchelor. Listen to Dwayne Lemon, Ivor Myers, Stephen Bohr, uh, Walter Veith. You need to listen to the people that have the public stamp. They all uphold the things that I just said. That's the official position of this church. We read the fundamental belief. We read their statement of confidence. We read Ellen White's own writings. So now you see she's just as authoritative because the rest of the way through here, other than some other um, one-offs, we're going to predominantly be reading quotes from her. So remember, that's what she said. She didn't write one heretical word. All of her writings were inspired under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Wasn't Ellen G. White hit in the head with a rock as a teenager and was put in a coma? That is correct. And there's a lot of speculation as, a, as to a, why, um, if that had, it obviously, up. it is. Um, when she was like nine, I believe it was, um, she, she got hit in the head with a rock and like wasn't supposed to live. And they actually try to point to this to say, see, God was sustaining her for the work that he had set out for. Her. Um, and but she brother, didn't die. Let me share one thing about me. I, w I was a year and a half. I fell off my crib crib and hit my head on the on the floor and i started bleeding externally doctor said thank god he did or he would have died so does that mean i was preserved because i'm a prophet oh i know using their uh, their own standard but uh yeah so now you see the foundation for for all of this that's where they're coming from with ellen white next i want to briefly cover what is called the great controversy paradigm this is the other thing you have to understand, and we're going to read something here that you're going to then see why that this is such a foundational thing. But this has to be understood because it is the filter and the lens for their worldview. It informs their understanding of the Godhead, Jesus, why he came, the nature of salvation, theodicy. Um, it's the backbone of how they define everything. Um, and I don't want to go deep on this, but it does need to be stated to understand some of the teachings and where the definitions are, are coming from. So, I'm going to read from the fundamental belief. It's short. The fundamental belief number eight, which is called The Great Controversy. The Great Controversy is a book by Ellen White. The Great Controversy was supposedly revealed to her in a vision, ironically, at a funeral. And that's predominantly where this is coming from. So there's the fundamental belief, which gives a summarized idea of this. There is the book by Ellen White, which, by the way, is the book of the year for the 2023 um, evangelistic outreach. They're seeking to give out one billion copies. So some of you in the audience may end up receiving one of these. And um, it's also what's called the Great Controversy theme. So it's a running thing through this whole movement. But it says, all humanity is now involved in a great controversy between Christ and Satan regarding the character of God, his law, and his sovereignty over the universe. This conflict originated in heaven when a created being, endowed with freedom of choice, in self-exaltation became Satan. He was Lucifer, and then he became Satan, God's adversary, and led into rebellion a portion of the angels. He introduced the spirit of rebellion into this world when he led Adam and Eve into sin. This human sin resulted in the distortion of the image of God in humanity the disordering of the created world, and its eventual devastation at the time of the global flood as presented in the historical account of Genesis 1-11. through 11. Observed by the whole creation, this world became the arena of the universal conflict out of which the God of love will ultimately be vindicated to assist his people in this controversy. Christ sends the Holy Spirit and the loyal angels to guide, protect, and sustain them in the way of salvation. So that is an like general overview. It's this idea 
And we're going to get into how this whole thing originated because this gets into the problem with their understanding of Christ, the Godhead, etc. But that's the overall fundamental belief. Now, I'm going to read from an article here. I will actually share this article so people can see themselves. I'm going to share screen. By the way, if you, if, okay. And you can also oh, send never, some never mind. Chat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a link on my computer, but actually I'm not going to be able to because it says it needs to sh shut down StreamYard because I haven't used it before on this computer and allow it some access that it needs it to reset. So I'll just read. Yeah. Um, if you want to reset, this, I'm here. You can come back. It's up to you. No, you're good. Um, okay. this, Any link this, you have at the cut you off, send me on the private chat and I can share it on my YouTube. So on private chat right there, you're going to see any link you have you send and I can then post it. Okay, per perfect. So this one, like I said, is on my desktop, but the other ones I will, uh, I'll link you to. So this is from Ministry Magazine, December 2000 edition. Ministry Magazine is what their church sends out to their pastors. So this is from the December 2000 issue, Ministry Magazine. This part that we're reading is by a guy named, by the name of Herbert E. Douglas. He was the president of the Weimer Institute, which is an Adventist institution in California. He has a, a THD, essentially. So this isn't some Joe Schmo. This is in their official publication. Quote, For Seventh-day Adventists, the great controversy theme is the core concept that brings coherence to all biblical subjects. It transcends the age-old divisions that have fractured the Christian church for centuries. It brings peace to theological adversaries who suddenly, yeah, who suddenly see in a new harmony the truths that each had been vigorously arguing for. Herein lies the uniqueness of Adventism. Let me zoom in a little bit here. That uniqueness is not some particular element of its theology, such as its sanctuary doctrine. Rather, the distinctiveness of Adventism rests in its overall understanding of the central message of the Bible that is governed by its seminal governing principle, the Great Controversy theme. Every philosophical or theological system builds upon a central governing theme or paradigm. Its central theme becomes the system's core truth and determines all of that system's principles and policies. Stephen Hawking, the remarkable Cambridge physicist, wrote in his 1988 book, A Brief History of Time, that should scientists discover the long-sought theory of everything to explain the varying mechanisms of the universe, we should know the mind of God. Seventh-day Adventists have been given that, a perspective that provides a theory of everything. It introduces us to the mind of God. We didn't discover it. It was given to us. We call it the great controversy theme. How we understand this core theme directly affects how we grasp the intent of biblical writers when they used words such as righteousness, salvation, gospel, etc. The great controversy theme helps us to work our way through centuries of theological confusion over the meaning of such realities as justification, sanctification, atonement, obedience, and works. Without the great controversy theme, all would remain divided over such subjects as the importance of the Old Testament sanctuary service and the New Testament view of Christ as our high priest and mediator, the meaning of faith and grace, the place of obedience in relation to legalism, why Jesus came the first time, why he came the way he did, and when he will return. Close quote. This is not some tertiary thing. This is how they define everything. It is through the lens of this supposed great controversy. So, keep those two things in mind. Ellen White and her level of authority. The great controversy theme. Because now we're going to transition into the Trinity. Adventists that listen to this, you need to pay very close attention. I want to start with Adventist.org slash Trinity. Their own website. Pastor Jose Laporte, if you end up watching this, you need to repent for lying telling me that your church was actually Trinitarian and that you were going to update your website within 24 hours of contacting me. It's been over a month now, almost, and it's still not updated because you know you're full of it. You know you guys aren't Trinitarian and you need to stop lying. You need to own up to what you actually teach and believe. Sorry, brother, I'm getting worked up here because this fires me up. You guys are heretics and you need to stop running the name of the triune God through the mud and trying to tell people the triune God is something that he is not. I want From you to be 
even more passionate, bro. You're come on. Don't worry. Perfect. Adventist.org slash Trinity, their own website. The opening sentence, Sam, your audience is are historic Christians. They understand this. Seventh-day Adventist Christians believe there is one God and that this one God is three co-eternal beings who work together in unity. Close quote. That's on their own website. Three beings, and what makes them one is their mission, purpose, character, etc. Where do I get that from? Well, we're going to read some more Ellen White, but if you scroll to the bottom of that page, the last heading, how does the Trinity work together? You list, listen to this, Sam, and you tell me if this sounds like the triune God. Have you ever been on a winning team? A team of students at school raising money? A team of coworkers trying to meet a sales goal? A community sports team? It's fun to be on the winning side. A team has a common goal. Remember, you're supposed to reject Nicene Trinitarianism for this. You're supposed to reject the Nicene Creed. Oh, that's paganism for, for this. Th this is a better summation for all of us. While each person may fill a different role, they all work together to accomplish the mission. The triune God may be compared to a winning team. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit work together in ways that a human team would never be able to for a common goal. While each person of the Godhead has a distinct role in the plan of salvation, they unite in their mission. Close quote. Now, there's a lot of pl plausible deniability in that part, and people could say, well, that does sound, you know, kind of close, you know, persons, that sort of thing. Okay, okay. Now we're going to look at History of Trinity in Adventism by Jerry Moon. Jerry Moon is the chair of church history at Andrews University in Berrien Springs, Michigan, like we mentioned earlier. You can look this up, Sam. I'll actually link you to it, um, like you were talking about, so that people can look at this themselves. We want to put this in the chat. This guy is a scholar. This isn't some Joe Schmo, the kooky cousin, as Doug Batchelor likes to say, to try and downplay this stuff as, um, oh, that's what friend. You know, they always go to the fringe people. They always want to accuse people like me of, oh, they just go to the kooky cousin. They go to the fringe. Well, if this is the kooky cousin, you guys got some problems. The chair of church history. Jerry Moon. In this paper, he says, just one second, I got to zoom out some here. He says, quote, a more substantial, this is this is about the history of the, Trini the, the Trinity in Seventh-day Adventism. They own their Aryan roots. By the way, folks, if you want to start at the beginning of this, you can see where he admits it, they were openly anti-Trinitarian, anti-Nicene creedal Trinitarianism, which they still are, by the way, they just now use the word Trinity, and there's been some involvement from where they initially were, but they're still heretics. Quote, a more substantial development was the continued quest to articulate a biblical doctrine of the Trinity, clearly differentiated from the Greek philosophical presuppositions that undergirded the traditional creedal statements. Raoul Dedrin has set forth in 1972 a brief exposition of the Godhead from the Old and New Testaments. He rejected the Trinity of speculative thought that created philosophical distinctions within the deity for which there is no definable basis within the revealed knowledge of God. Instead, he advocated the example of his apostles, rejecting the terms of Greek mythology or metaphysics that expressed their convictions in an unpretending Trinitarian confession of faith, the doctrine of one God subsisting and acting in three persons. Building on this line of thought, Fernando Canal, Dedrin's student, set forth in 1983 a radical critique of the Greek philosophical presuppositions underlying what Dederin had referred to as speculative thought. Canal's dissertation, A Criticism of Theological Reason, argued that Roman Catholic and classical Protestant theology took its most basic presuppositions about the nature of God, time, and existence from the framework provided by Aristotelian philosophy. Canal maintained that for Christian theology to become truly biblical, it must derive its primordial presupposition from Scripture, not from Greek mythology. In the more recent Handbook of Seventh-day Adventist Theology, year 2000, edited by Dedrin, Canal authored a magisterial article in the findings from its continuing work on the doctrine of God. Again, 
Canal explicitly differentiates between a doctrine of God based on Greek philosophical presuppositions and one based on biblical presuppositions, making a strong case for his view that only through a willingness to depart from the philosophical conception of God as timeless and to embrace the historical conception of God as presented in the Bible can one discover a truly biblical view of the Trinity. The long process of change from early Adventists' initial rejection of creedal Trinitarianism to their eventual acceptance of a doctrine of the Trinity could rightly be called a search for a biblical Trinity. They were not so much prejudiced against traditional formulas as they were determined to hew their doctrines as closely as possible to the line of Scripture. In order, to believe their, in order to base their beliefs on Scripture alone and to disenfranchise tradition from exercising any theological authority, they found it methodologically essential to reject every doctrine not clearly grounded in Scripture alone. Since the traditional doctrine of the Trinity clearly contained unscriptural elements, they rejected it, talking about the pioneers. Eventually, however, they became convinced of the basic concept of one God in three persons, and that it was indeed found in Scripture. Part two of this study will consider in more detail the role of Ellen White in that process. Okay, in that case, so you heard there, they reject Nicene Creedal Trinitarianism as being Aristotelian philosophy, so thus in their minds, it isn't biblical. So they don't think the Nicene Creed, Sam, was composed with Scripture in mind. It was some other pagan philosophy that was just um, creeping its way in um, to the church in its Roman Catholic uh, popery. So they openly reject Nicene Creedal Trinitarianism, and they're still open about that today. So when they use the word Trinity, they're not Trinitarian. This is them seeking to blend in due to the heat that they faced back with Walter Martin in the 50s, and that's a discussion for another time. But did you notice, too, that he said they don't believe that God is timeless? That is also part of what they think is a part of this Aristotelian idea of God. So he mentioned part two there. So now I want to look at part two of that and read a quote from it. I'll link you to it here, Sam, so that people can check it out themselves. Again, folks, these are official sources from their own sites, their own scholars. This isn't simply hearsay. And as you see, I'm not quote mining. We're reading large swaths of these things. Of these things. This article says, Quote, it appears to be a pattern in Seventh-day Adventist history that God seldom gave light by visions until his people had done their best to investigate what the scriptures had to say on the subject. This is the same guy, Jerry Moon. The few exceptions were cases where perhaps God saw there was too much at stake to wait for the normal process to work itself out. Much more often, he allowed partial truth or outright error to stand for months or even years while people studied it and evaluated it from Scripture. If the error would be refuted from Scripture, God didn't need to send a vision to deal with it. While the, Ad- while the early Adventists eschewed the term Trinity, much of what they did believe was compatible with Trinitarianism. As they occasionally acknowledged, the pioneers in the 1840s and 50s were approaching the Bible from the standpoint of other extremely important doctrines, such as the earthly and heavenly sanctuaries, which have everything to do with the character of God. So remember when we read the fundamental belief and great controversy? This whole controversy is supposedly about the character of God. In the divine purpose for this movement, pay attention here, folks. The understanding of the character of God was a higher priority than understanding his nature, end quote. That was not important to them, that you're wrong on the nature of God. Eschatology was more important to them. They were more focused on, that's a deal breaker. You can't be not historicist premillennial in Seventh-day Adventism, or, or you're a heretic. But you can be an Aryan heretic. You can't eat bacon because you have to follow the dietary restrictions that Ellen White set forth in the health message without being a heretic. But you can be an Aryan heretic. So folks, that should tell you the kookiness of this movement and its pioneers. Now, can I ask, before, move on, so clarification. Like I said, I'm not young anymore. I throw it. So 
<clears throat> they don't believe God is timeless. So what do they believe about God and time? We're, we're going to get to that. Okay. Well, we will, we will get to that because, um, yeah, we'll, we'll get to that. Um, but I want to play a quick, a couple of clips here. One is 15 seconds. One is one minute long. I want to play a clip from one of their scholars. You're going to hear from his own mouth. He's an Ellen White scholar. He is one of my former professors. Him and I have discussed these things at great length. I'm hoping actually this spring to do some more content with him if he's willing to have it on record from his own mouth. Nice guy, nothing against him, but you can hear it yourselves. Um, so I'm going to try and play a file here. Okay, here it is. His name is Judd Lake. I hit open. Brother. I am Judd Lake. I'm a professor at Southern Adventist University. My focus is on Ellen White studies and preaching. Just a, a piggyback on uh, the, the Q&A, you know, when you think about tritheism, three gods, one God. To me, it's, it's very clear in the marriage relationship. Go back to Genesis. One flesh, two individuals. One flesh, two indiv individuals. Imagine if... The, the husband and wife were surgically connected. You'd have some problems. Imagine the fights. <laughs> but there'd be less divorce because then you'd have to have radical surgery. So how are they one flesh? They're one in mind, in purpose, in, in their characters, in their life together. One flesh, two individuals. One God, three individuals. They're united in their purpose, in their character, in their mission. Just a follow-up on the Q&A. Did you catch it, brother? I've heard you use this analogy before to say Adam and Eve is an example that is not a good example because they were of one nature, but it is not a correct representation of the personhood of God. You have separ two separate beings still. Exactly. <clears throat> you also have to understand when they say the phrase God, they're not using it the way we are. When we say it, we're essentially talking about state of being, mode of existence, etc. They are using it in a familial sense. It is like a title for their family. And they are well, three separate when they say persons, what they mean is beings. They don't exactly. mean they don't mean three sent like the ability to will and self-reflect. Like all three, you know, your classic Trinity diagram. The Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Father. Spirit is not the Son. Spirit is not the Father. But they're all God. It's not that. They openly reject that. They are tritheists. So they're getting questions like this because people are like, so how exactly is this working? Which is why you get people like you had on your show a couple years ago, that kid quick thinking, who you asked, is it three gods or one? And he goes, three gods. And you said, so you're polytheist? No, one God. Because, yes. brother, they think that if you are able to tell every sign and symbol and you've cracked the code on Revelation, that's what matters. Not that you're all confused worshiping a different God or gods in some cases. Now I'm going to play a second clip here. It's 15 seconds. And let me this is just clarify just one point. <clears throat> Go for it. I've made this clear in sessions I just did. I said Adam is a finite, temporal, <clears throat> physical, <clears throat> limited analogy to an infinite God, so they're not identical. So when I've used the analogy, I've said that man is limited, temporal, finite. He's not identical to God. And male and female are separate physical beings and persons, but God is one being. So it's sad that they use that analogy that we would use biblically and correctly, but they would then take it and run with it to show that God and man are more alike and that just like Adam and Eve are two separate human beings, there are three separate gods, but they come together in a unity. So it's sad they would do that, but go ahead, brother. And you heard him say that what makes them one is their mission, purpose, character, not their being. And we just saw on their website, folks, three beings. Three beings. So take that for what it's worth. I want to play a second clip now. This is from what's supposed to be the official Advent Defense League. Edwin Cotto, 
Marcus Thaler, uh, these guys. Edwin Cotto, the head of this circus, has people alongside him who are full-blown Aryan heretics. Y'all know who you are. They don't want to talk about these things because it causes too much heat and flack. He has guys in his ranks who want to go back to the old path style of Seventh-day Adventists like Nader Monsur. So I want to play a clip here from his show the other night so that you can see these are the apologists, the Seventh-day Adventist apologists, folks. You can see it from their own mouths. You ju we just read that article where Jerry Moon himself said, yeah, we're not big on, we weren't big on the, the nature of God. Other things were more important, like the investigative judgment and the sanctuary doctrine. So here you go. 15 second clip. Oh, wrong one. I am Judd Lennon. The, the ministry know that it's not a big topic with us because I'm of the opinion that really um, we're neither of the two camps are going to figure it out fully. We're talking about divinity here. So play it again. Uh, it's a topic, the Trinity, that um, people who follow the, the ministry know that it's not a big topic with us because I'm of the opinion that really um, we're neither of the two camps are going to figure it out fully. We're talking about divinity here. So never mind that this has been settled, Sam, for 1800 years. We're never going to figure it out. So it just doesn't matter. So it's OK if we're running around with Aryan heretics anti-Trinitarian anti heretics. Nah, that's not what's important. What's important is that you're not eating bacon and you understand every sign and symbol of Revelation. So he really said he doesn't care if they're Adventists that are outright anti-Trinitarian Aryan heretics. It's okay because we're not going to figure it out and he still wants to recognize them as legitimate Adventists. Is that what he's getting at? Sam, people at the Advent Defense League are Aryans. And Edwin has told them to pipe down because it causes public division amongst them. So it's not, and as you just saw him say there, it's not an important issue for them. There's other things that are more important. These are their apologists, man. I, the Advent, He's not like, it's not like Adventist trademark defense league. He actually had to change the name, I believe, because he initially it was the Adventist defense league, but they have a very, they're very protective over their Adventist trademark. So he changed it to the Advent Defense League. So I don't know how much they want to affiliate with people like him. But this just goes to show you, anti-Trinitarians are welcome in this movement, oftentimes applauded for being brave enough to embrace the, the theology of the pioneers and reject the, quote, pagan Roman Catholic Trinity. Just carouse the comments on my channel and you'll see these people. You'll see them. Somebody just commented uh, yesterday, actually, said, if you're worshiping the Trinity, you're worshiping a false god. You're a heretic. So those are the Seventh-day Adventists, um, and, and uh, people like that are amongst their, their ranks. So, okay, so you just heard how the Trinity is understood in Seventh-day Adventism. It's not Orthodox Trinitarianism. Now we're going to go to the Ellen quotes. This quote is, well, you'll see. Quote. I have frequently been falsely charged with teaching views peculiar to spiritualism. But before the editor of the Daystar, that paper I mentioned earlier, ran into that delusion, the Lord gave me a view of the sad and desolating effects that would be pronounced upon the flock by him and others in teaching spiritual views. I have often seen the lovely Jesus, that he is a person. So we're going to get into how they define person here based on this quote. I asked him if his father was a person and had a form like himself. Said Jesus, I am in the express image of my father's person. So when Judd Lake said person earlier, like I said, he doesn't mean the ability to will and self-reflect, like we would say. Like, how do you describe the personages? Well, they, they can speak. Uh, each one can speak. Um those types of things. No, no, it's not just that. Each one has a corporeal form. Second quote. This is from Faith I Live By, page 40. The online code is FLB 40.4. Quote, I saw a throne, 
and on it sat the Father and the Son. I gazed on Jesus' countenance and admired his lovely person. That word again. The Father's person could not be, uh, I could not behold, for a cloud of glorious light covered him. I asked Jesus if his Father had a form like himself. He said he had, but I could not behold it. For, said he, if you should once behold the glory of his person, you would cease to exist. Close quote. So the Father, in their view, has a corporeal form. This is from Special Testimonies, Series B, 7, colon, 5, 1. The online code is EV617.3. Quote, We are to cooperate with the three highest powers in heaven, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And these powers will work through us, making us workers together with God. Close quote. This quote, Testimonies for the Church, containing messages of warning and instruction for Seventh-day Adventists, page 63. The code is SPTB07-63.3. Quote, There are three living persons in the heavenly trio. In the name of these three great powers, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, those who receive Christ by living faith are baptized, and these powers will cooperate with the obedient subjects of heaven in their efforts to live the new life in Christ. Close quote. Another quote. Letters and Manuscripts, Volume 21, 1906, Manuscript 95. Quote. Here is where the work of the Holy Ghost comes in, after your baptism. You are baptized in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. You are raised up out of the water to live henceforth in newness of life, to live a new life. You are born unto God, and you stand under the sanction and the power of the three holiest beings in heaven, who are able to keep you from falling. You are to reveal that you are dead to sin, your life is hid with Christ and God. This is the most precious promise. When I feel oppressed and hardly know how to relate myself toward the work that God has given me to do, I just call upon the three great worthies and say, you know that I cannot do this work of my own strength. Close quote. Another quote, Letters and Manuscripts, Volume 15, Manuscript 27A from 1900, Paragraph 22. So when they try to tell you, oh no, that was early on in Ellen's life, Oh, no, no, they, she reformed. She came around to full-blown Trinitarianism. 1900, 15 years before she died. Quote, that other one was from 1906, saying three beings, nine years prior to her death. Quote, three distinct agencies, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, work together for human beings. They are united in the work of making the church on earth like the church in heaven. Close quote. So consistent with what their website says, they're, the mission, the unity, is in mission, purpose, and character, not being. Now, I want to read a quote from J.S. Washburn. He was deeply connected by pedigree with the organization's leading pioneers. He's essentially credited, well, not essentially, he is. He's credited with helping establish the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists in Washington, D.C. We can't go into all of that. But the General Conference is, Ellen White said when the General Conference is in session, again, back to the comment on the magisterium and this down with a magisterium. Ellen White said that when the General Conference is in session, it is the highest governing a body, it is the highest authority governing body meeting on earth. But I want to read a quote from him. He, while he doesn't have the same level of, of authority that Ellen White does, I want you to hear their attitude toward Orthodox Nicene Trinitarianism and where it came from. This is still the thinking in their church today, by the way, despite their use of the word Trinity, and showcases what the movement was built upon. This quote is a little long, but please pay close attention. It is a, from a, for, a letter that he wrote in 1939, so after Ellen's gone, that was circulated by the General Conference president at the time to 30 of their pastors. The letter is titled, the Trinity. Sam, I'm going to link you to this here. 
in the comments for you to share with everyone else. This is a scan from the actual letter that is online that has been transcribed. And I'm going to read an excerpt here. Quote, again, it's a little long. Please, folks, pay close attention. The doctrine of the Trinity is regarded as the supreme test of orthodoxy by the Roman Catholic Church. Many of the councils of that church during its development were almost entirely given over to the discussion of the Trinity, the Arian and the Trinitarian controversy. Was Christ of the same substance of the Father or of like substance? Very naturally, the nature of the personality of God was the center, the core, the key of the teachings of Roman theology, Satan's crowning masterpiece of apostate counterfeit Christianity. The doctrine of the Trinity is a cruel heathen monstrosity. Removing Jesus from his true position of divine savior and mediator, it is true we cannot me- we, uh, it is it is true we cannot measure or define divinity. It is beyond our finite understanding. Sounds like what Edwin said, did it not? Does it not? Yet on this subject of the personality of God, the Bible is very simple and plain. The Father, the Ancient of Days, is from eternity. Jesus was begotten to the Father, or of the Father. Jesus, speaking through the psalmist, says, and he quotes Psalm 2 7, the Lord, and then he puts Jehovah, hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day I have begotten thee. In these scriptures, Jesus himself says the Father's name is Jehovah, his own name, Adonai. Put in Exodus 23 31, the Lord said he would send his angel before his people, literally his messenger, and said, My name is in him. So God placed his name in his son. So on earth, the name of every father is in his son. It is therefore permissible to say that the son may be spoken of as Jehovah, but primarily, fundamentally, the son said his father's name is Jehovah. Close quote. The Trinity is a heathen monstrosity. That's the pioneers of this movement, folks. So when they tell you, Oh no, we've changed the 1919 Bible Conference, the Minneapolis Conference. Yeah, and what you guys articulated in that still ain't orthodox. They are the most confused people on who God is, and it is sad. It is sad. Adventists, give this up. The church has dealt with this. The church has known who God is for long before you guys were around. God bless you, uh, Misael Alejandro. May God bless your journey. So with all that in mind, oh man, wow. I don't know how to say Salone. That's incredible. Again, may God bless your journey. Um, Now I want to get into the Adventist Jesus. So we talked earlier about the great controversy. This is why that was important to understand. Because now we're going to get into that great controversy and you're going to see. Remember, The Great Controversy theme defines everything in Adventism. It tells of their mission, what they believe about God, why God came, what the gospel is, what salvation means, what justification, sanctification, etc. This is from the Spirit of Prophecy. So the Spirit of Prophecy is actually a volume set as well. I believe four or I don't remember how many volumes on that one. But the Spirit of Prophecy is also a volume set. So sometimes it refers to the entirety of the writings, but it can, in certain contexts, be referring to that volume set. That's what this is from. Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 1, page 17. The code is 1SP17.2. Quote, The great creator assembled the heavenly host, that's the Father, that he might, in the presence of all the angels, confer special honor upon his Son, Remember, this is prior to the creation of the uh, of earth. The Son was seated on the throne with the Father, and the heavenly throng of holy angels was gathered around them. The Father then made known that it was ordained by himself that Christ, his Son, should be equal with himself, so that wherever was the presence of his Son, it was as his own presence. Close quote. So this is what supposedly started the great controversy, as you're going to see. Jesus was at this point as well given omnipresence. 
He was elevated and exalted to be made equal with the Father. Second quote, Patriarchs and Prophets, one of her most famous works. Great Controversy, Desire of Ages, and Patriarchs and Prophets are like the capstone of her books. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 37. The code is PP37.1. The exaltation of the Son of God as equal with the Father was represented as an injustice to Lucifer, who, it was claimed, was also entitled to reverence and honor. So this whole controversy supposedly started because at the moment of Jesus' exaltation to be equal with the Father, Lucifer became jealous and thought, why am I not the one that's being exalted? You'll find other quotes where she says that Lucifer was next to the Father. Christ, me, go ahead. I, don't, I want people to hear this. So you just read authoritative statements. Guys, listen to this. Jesus was not equal to the Father, but the Father in love made him equal which means he wasn't equal to begin with, made him equal. And then Lucifer got jealous because <clears throat> he wanted to be made equal, but instead he chose the son, which means that there was a point in time where the son and Lucifer were on the same level. And so Lucifer got angry when the son was exalted to a higher level, making him equal to the father. And then earlier, when Jesus supposedly told Ellen G. White, you can see me, but you can't see the Father. That too shows the Father is a greater God and a more glorious God than the Son, because if they're equal, why can't I see the Son, not the Father? Blast me from the pit of hell. Anathema to Ellen G. White, who's in hell. Keep going. Again, from Patriarchs and Prophets, page 36. Quote, the king of the universe, talking about the Father, summoned the heavenly host before him that in their presence he might set forth the true position of his son. Close quote. For anyone who affirms Orthodox Trinitarianism, you know that Christ did not humble himself prior to creation. This quote is an event that Ellen claims Lucifer later looks back on as an injustice. So in this quote, the context Go to it yourself. Again, Patriarch's Prophets, page 36. She's saying that Lucifer and the other angels were eyewitnesses to this event, Sam, where Christ was exalted to be made equal with the Father and is going to accuse the angels in heaven of being eyewitnesses to this and praising it. That's what she is going to claim. This heresy, this blasphemous doctrine that she wants to say the Holy Spirit inscripturated or, uh, you know, inspired, is going to say that this heresy took place in heaven and all of the heavenly host applauded it, looking on. But then Satan was sitting there thinking, why am I not the one having this exalted on me? And then pride took over. That's what started the controversy. And remember, folks, this is the theme that informs all of their theology. You can't get away from this. This is the, the primary deal breaker for me that caused me to realize this is from the pit of hell. There's no escaping this. This is blasphemous doctrine. This is not the Jesus of history and scripture. You need to, Adventists, you need to get honest about this. You need to denounce this heresy. You need to flee from this. This is a false Christ who cannot save you. He is not real. He is an idol. And if you are worshiping the God that Ellen G. White was teaching here, you are worshiping a false Christ. Quote, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 37. His desire, Lucifer, for supremacy returned and envy of Christ was once more indulged. Close quote. So in this great controversy narrative, which is the lens again through which they define everything, was the first domino in this chain. He desired to be exalted from a lower place in created order to a higher place and was jealous of what he witnessed. The son who was in a lower place of created order and was exalted to a higher one. Get this one. Adventists, and if, if the guys at the Advent Defense League are out there, I challenge you to come on to my show and let's discuss this quote. And I want to hear your guys' defense to this. The pathetic defense that you guys give to this that I already know. I want to see you guys defend this publicly. 
Lift him up, page 253. The code is LHU253.3. Quote, There is no one who can explain the mystery of the incarnation of Christ. Yet we know that he came to this earth and lived as a man among men. The man Christ Jesus was not the Lord God Almighty. Yet Christ and the Father are one. The deity did not sink under the agonizing torture of Calvary. Yet it is nonetheless true that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Close quote. Sam, their apologist defense to this is, no, no, no. She was using the term Lord God Almighty as a name for the Father. She was just saying he's not the Father. This is from the Holy Spirit, supposedly. Jesus is not the Lord God Almighty. Never mind the fact that he's the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Never mind the fact that he's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Never mind the fact that at the end of Revelation, all of creation, Jesus, separate and distinct from that, receives worship, honor, and glory from all of the creation, rightfully so. Blasphemy. Blasphemy, heresy from the pit of hell. So she's on record saying, no, Jesus is not the Lord God Almighty. So you didn't misread that. I will read you the quote again if you would like. You can look it up for yourself, folks. Sink in. Now I want to sink in. Guys, did you hear it? Ellen G. White, the prophetess whom the Holy Spirit gave revelation, who saw Jesus, who was taken to heaven, and Jesus told her he's the express image of the Father. You can see me. You can't see the Father because you'll be consumed, basically. And this prophetess said, Jesus is not the Lord God Almighty. So read that one more time. I want it to sink in for the shock value. You all, fa- you all fact check me. Lift him up, page 253, LHU 253.3. Quote, there is no one who can explain the mystery of the incarnation of Christ, yet we know that he came to this earth and lived as a man among men. The man, Christ Jesus, was not the Lord God Almighty, yet Christ and the Father are one. The deity did not sink under the agonizing torture of Calvary, yet it is nonetheless true that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Close quote. Next quote. The Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 2, page 9. 2SP 9.1. Quote. The Son of God was next in authority to the great lawgiver, the Father. He knew that his life alone could be sufficient to ransom fallen men. He was of much more value than man as his noble, spotless character and exalted office as commander of all the heavenly host were above the work of man. He was in the express image of his father, not in features alone, but in perfection of character. Close quote. Yet again, she sang that God the Father has a corporeal form. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 34, PP 34.1. Quote, The Sovereign of the Universe, talking about the Father, was not alone in his work of beneficence. He had an associate, a co-worker, who could appreciate his purposes and could share his joy in giving happiness to created beings. Christ, the Word, the only begotten of God, was one with the Eternal Father, one in nature, in character, in purpose. The only being that could enter into all the counsels and purposes of God. Close quote. She differentiates Jesus from the Sovereign, says he's a separate being, which makes you have to ask, if Christ is the only being able to enter these counsels, what about the Holy Spirit? Have you noticed the lacking of the Holy Spirit in all of this? There was a period of time where the early Adventists believed that the Spirit was nothing more than a force or an energy that proceeded from the Father and the Son. They've since changed on that now, and they'll say, well, no, the Holy Spirit is a person, or is a person. But either way, he either isn't a being, according to this quote, or he is, but he's a lesser being. Because why isn't the Holy Spirit allowed in these councils that Jesus is now allowed into that he wasn't previously allowed into? Because he's the only being 
allowed to enter into these councils, clearly saying a separate being from the Father. Then she says, Jesus was made the sovereign of heaven and taken into special councils of God the Father, which prior to his exaltation, he didn't have access to. Quote, the Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 1, page 18. 1 SP 18.1. Quote, Satan was envious and jealous of Christ. Christ had been taken into the special counsels of God in regard to his plans, while Satan was unacquainted with them. He did not understand, neither was he permitted to know, the purposes of God. But Christ was acknowledged the sovereign of heaven, his power and authority to be the same as that of God himself. Satan thought that he him thought that he was himself a favorite in heaven among the angels. He had been highly exalted, but this did not call forth from him gratitude and praise to his creator. He aspired to the height of God himself. He gloried in his loftiness. He knew that he was honored by the angels. He had a special mission to execute. He had been near the great creator. That's a common phrase she uses alongside the next two phrase. So remember, Jesus and Lucifer were both next to God the Father. He had been near the great creator and the ceaseless beams of glorious light enshrouded the eternal, enshrouding the eternal God had shone especially on him. Satan thought how angels had obeyed his command was pleasurable alacrity. Were not his garments light and beautiful? Why should Christ thus be honored before himself? Close quote. But it gets worse, brother. I know that your mind is probably just exploding right now in just the heresy that's just flowing as we read right now. But it gets worse. It gets a lot worse. Buckle up. Now she says, this is after Satan has gone to earth. This is in that same storyline, folks. You can read all about this in the Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 1. You start at page 17, the fall of Satan, then into the creation, and this is essentially an overview of that. This is from Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 1, page 45. 1 SP, 45.1. Quote, Sorrow filled heaven as it was realized that man was lost and the world that God created was to be filled with mortals doomed to misery, sickness, and death, and there was no way to escape for the offender. The whole family of Adam must die. Remember, this is from her great controversy vision. I saw the lovely Jesus. So here it is. I saw the lovely Jesus and beheld an expression of sympathy and sorrow upon his countenance. Soon I saw him approach the exceeding bright light, which enshrouded the father said my accompanying angel. So she claimed to have an accompanying angel who was showing a lot of these things to her. Said my accompanying angel, he is in close converse with the father. The anxiety of the angels seemed to be intense while Jesus was communing with his father. Three times he was shut in by the glorious light about the father, and the third time he came from the father, his person could be seen. Talking about Jesus. His countenance was calm, free from all perplexity and trouble, and shone with benevolence and loveliness, such as words cannot express. He then made known to the angelic host that a way of escape had been made for lost man. Catch this, folks. He told them that he had been pleading with his father and had offered to give his life a ransom and take the sentence of death upon himself that through him man might find pardon that through the merits of his blood and obedience to the law of God, they could have the favor of God and be brought into the beautiful garden and eat of the fruit of the tree of life. Close quote. She taught Jesus had to try three times to convince the father that he would be the sacrifice to redeem man. In Adventist theology, Sam, the father is taught of as not being a loving father. He's taught of being as a angry, vindictive just like smoke pouring out of the ears type. And the sun is what's standing between you and him as like trying to be the mediator and, and bring peace. 
So that's the sort of thinking that's coming through with this, that after three times, Jesus had to try to convince the Father that he would be the one to be the ransom sacrifice. This is insane heresy, folks. This is absurd. Adventists, to try and say that this is biblical is insane. It is asinine. This is doctrine from the pits of hell. She also says that the law of God is essentially, which this gets into their whole theory about the law of God, which we're not going to get into tonight, but is a whole nother thing. The law of God is really what started all of this, Sam. Satan went around spreading these rumors saying they believe that when they say the law of God, they only mean the Ten Commandments, the Decalogue. They think that the Ten Commandments, there's actually a physical Ten Commandments up in heaven, and that's actually what's governing heaven. And that Satan started going around spreading rumors to the angels saying God's law isn't fair. This was after he became jealous that Jesus was exalted. So now he's attacking the law of God. And part of this great controversy and their view of the atonement is that God is vindicating his character. That he essentially is beholden to the accusations of Satan. Because the answer they give for like why God didn't just obliterate Satan immediately is because they say, well, if he would have done that, it would have proven Satan's accusations that God's not fair to be true. How would that look if Satan made these accusations and then that God is a tyrant and then he blots him out and just, you know, eliminates him? That would further vindicate the devil's accusations. So he had to come up with some sort of plan. And that's now what's unfolding in our life. That's what informs this whole great controversy idea. But again, here, you also saw from that quote that there's division within the Godhead. The son has to convince the father. Okay. Again, Jesus presented the plan of redemption to the father, and he had to be convinced of executing it. Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 1, page 47, 1 SP 47, 1. Quote, Jesus bade the heavenly host be reconciled to the plan that his father accepted and rejoiced that fallen man could be exalted again through his death to obtain favor with God and enjoy heaven. Close quote. Some more about the Adventist Jesus. Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 1, page 48, 1 SP, 48.3. Quote, Satan again rejoiced uh, with his angels that he could, by causing man's fall, so this is in that part of the narrative, pull down the Son of God from his exalted position. So Satan rejoiced when man fell because he said, Aha, now Jesus is going to have to step down from his level of exaltation that he was uh, elevated to. He told his angels that when Jesus should take fallen man's nature, he could overpower him and hinder the accomplishment of the plan of salvation. Close quote. She said, upon man falling, Satan rejoiced that he was able to pull Jesus down from his exalted position and that Jesus would have to take on a fallen, sinful human nature. Quote two. Sinful nature? Brother, just, you'll see. Okay. It was in order, or sorry, it was in the order of God that Christ should take upon himself the form and nature of fallen man. What nature does fallen man have? That he might be made perfect through suffering. He needed made perfect through that and himself endure the strength of Satan's fierce temptations, that he might understand how to succor those who should be tempted. Close quote. Jesus took on... These are just two quotes on this, brother. I could give you countless quotes on this, that Jesus had a fallen, sinful nature identical to ours. They do not understand the virgin birth, and that they think the virgin birth essentially just had to do with God performing a miracle for demonstrating a miracle. That it's not really more than that. But it gets worse. Manuscript number 37. I.8. Quote, Christ bore the sins of the whole world. He endured our punishment, the wrath of God against transgression. His trial involved the fierce temptation of thinking that he was forsaken by God. His soul was tortured by the pressures of a horror of great darkness, lest he should swerve from his uprightness during the terrible ordeal. 
He could not have been tempted in all points like as man is tempted had there been no possibility of his falling. He was a free agent placed on probation. They have a whole doctrine and theory around probation. As was Adam and as is man. Unless there is a possibility of yielding, temptation is no temptation. Temptation comes and is resisted when man is powerfully influenced to do a wrong action and knowing that he can do it, resist by faith with a firm hold upon divine power. This was the ordeal through which Christ passed. Close quote. She says Christ could have sinned but chose not to and was on a probationary period having a trial, which they believe we all will have, by the way, when we get to the investigative judgment. In fact... She said Jesus did sin. Get this. The Desire of Ages, page 753. DA, 753.2. Quote. Folks, pay close attention here. This is her commenting on the crucifixion. She claims to be shown what was taking place while the Lord Jesus was on the cross. Satan, with his fierce temptations, wrung the heart of Jesus, twisted the heart of Jesus. The Savior could not see through the portals of the tomb. Hope did not present to him his coming forth from the grave a conqueror or tell him of the Father's acceptance of his sacrifice. He feared that sin was so offensive to God that their separation was to be eternal. Close quote. This damnable, blasphemous woman from the pit of hell, who was inspired by demons, said that the devil was able to cause the Lord Jesus to doubt whether he'd be resurrected or if his sacrifice would be accepted before the Father. I spit on this. I I wipe my rear end with this blasphemous, demonic, disgusting doctrine that completely demotes and demeans our Lord. Adventists, you need to get honest about this. So I want people to understand what you just read from her mouth. Satan was able to corrupt and taint and pollute Jesus' thoughts, his feelings, his emotions, his heart, because he made Jesus fearful and doubtful that he was a good enough atoning sacrifice and that the Father would then reject the sacrifice and eternally sever Jesus from him. And that's what Satan caused Jesus to feel on the cross. Yes. So that's what she said, right? <clears throat> yes. This filthy dog who's burning in hell, who now is even worse than Muhammad. That's what she taught. All right. Again, folks, if you want to look that up, Desire of Ages, page 753. DA 753. Adventists, I want to see you justify this. Defend it. Come onto my channel and let's talk about this phrase. Demonic doctrine, Sam demonic doctrine but it gets even worse spirit of prophecy volume three we're probably only going to get on this session through the section here on jesus and we'll save the other two sections which which is perfect because they're going to be a whole session in and of themselves but this is important for us to cap off the the trinity and christ which at that point is there any question now folks this woman says she didn't write a single line of heresy the holy spirit inspired this Demonic. Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 3, 3SP, 203.2. And brother, if I sound like I'm getting worked up, I I apologize. But this offends me. I want you to get more worked up, man. I'm the one controlling this because I want to snap. But even here in the comments there, like three people said the same thing. How could it possibly get worse? Well, go ahead. Folks, Sam, we're only hitting the, the tip of the iceberg on this cult. Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 3, 3 3SP, 203.2. Quote, They believe in essentially soul sleep. They use the term state of the dead because they don't like soul sleep because that's associated with the Jehovah's Witnesses. 
but it's the same essential thing. So remember, Jesus had the exact nature like we do. We don't have an immaterial aspect to our being. We're just breath and a body. When the breath leaves the body, the body just goes back to the ground and you essentially cease to exist. Jesus had that same nature. Remember that. Quote, when he closed his eyes in death upon the cross, the soul of Christ did not go at once to heaven as many believe. Or how could his words be true? I am not yet ascended to my father. The spirit of Jesus slept in the tomb with his body and did not wing its way to heaven. There to maintain a separate existence and look down upon the mourning disciples embalming the body from which it had taken flight. All that comprised the life and intelligence of Jesus remained with his body in, a, in the sepulcher. And when he came forth, it was as a whole being. He did not have to summon his spirit from heaven. He had power to lay down his life and to take it up again. She's going to contradict herself here in this next quote, by the way, but close quote. You have to understand the system to understand what's being said here, Sam. For three days, Jesus essentially was not conscious or aware. Then get this. Faith I Live By, page 50, FLB 50.5. Quote, He who died for the sins of the world was to remain in the tomb the allotted time. He was in that stony prison house as a prisoner of divine justice. He was responsible to the judge of the universe. He was bearing the sins of the world, and his father only could release him. Close quote. So he didn't know if he would be accepted, his sacrifice would be accepted, or if he would come out of the, the, the tomb a conqueror. And he wasn't able to resurrect himself. Con you know, contrary to John 3, contrary to Jesus' own plain words and saying, I have the authority to lay my life down and take it back up again. Contrary to Jesus saying, destroy this temple and I'll raise it in three days. No, Jesus wasn't able to do that. He was a prisoner to the Father and it was only the Father who was able to resurrect him. Brother. So, I, just so people can see the shock. The Adventist Jesus, Ellen G. White's Jesus, had been contaminated. Now, I know this is not the language they'll use because they want to be politically correct because they realize if they say it, everyone's going to condemn them as worse than Muslims because they yes. pretend to be Christian. And they are worse <clears throat> than Muslims because they masquerade as Christians. So the Adventist Jesus had his heart, his mind, his will, his emotions contaminated, polluted, corrupted, tainted by Satan on the cross where he doubted whether the father would be pleased with him to accept his sacrifice and started being afraid that he'd be severed from the father. When he died, he was pr basically a pr prisoner to the father at his mercy, whether the father would accept him and raise him. And for those three days, he's no longer conscious because soul sleep means secession of existence. So then how in the world do they believe he was divine? Because if he is divine, made equal to the father, even though he wasn't equal, God is ever living. So that means this blasphemous, wicked daughter of Satan is pretty much saying he wasn't even truly God when he died because you can't be God and cease to exist. And remember, she said that the deity, back when she said that Jesus is not the Lord God Almighty, she said the deity did not sink under the cross. The agonizing torture of the cross. So this then gets into which um, they affirm the canonic heresy. Oh, my goodness. The butchering of Philippians 2.6. I was just about to say Philippians 2.6 and that they say Jesus gave up his divinity because in this great controversy, Sam, she says that Jesus had to make the decision, essentially, between staying in his... his so they'll use like 2 Corinthians uh, uh, 5.8 where through his poverty we might become rich. And he left his riches and, and took on poverty. They'll use that as well as Philippians 2, like you mentioned, to say essentially Jesus had to make a choice that he would give up, for example, his omnipotence 
or, or sorry, omnipresence, omnipresence. Sorry. So that, he wasn't God anymore. That's basically it. He ceased to be God. Right. Because Sam, when they use the term God, they're, they're using it in a familial term. So they're saying it's, it's not that it's the attributes that one possesses that makes one uh, part of g the Godhead. It's this familial sense that like, it's almost like your last name, like Shamoon is like your familial title. And it's like that, like God is the familial title. Yeah. So he's not immutably God. It's just simply a position, a status that the father confers on him, but can be taken away. Because if you're God by nature, then it's immutably so. So correct. Got, correct. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So and brother, oh boy. I'm I'm willing to keep going if your audience wants me to keep going. If you don't want to keep going, we don't have no, to keep yeah. going. No, here's the thing. You had four sections. Did you cover at the second one? These two? We 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 had five. We covered three. These last two, that was the longest one. These next two um are they've got a, a about four I've got four pages of, of notes on them, yeah. but that was the longest section. The reason why is because it's I don't mind doing three, four hours, but why? It's because it's two hours. I want to bring you yeah. back. Yep. To go as slow as possible for part Perfect. two and then Q and A. Perfect. I don't want to rush this because we don't have yep. enough on Seven Day Adventism. I yep. did provide the link to your own YouTube channel. Everyone, you got to go subscribe. Eat up his stuff because this is stuff we need to know. We're gonna do it part two, and as soon as you want to do it, because I'm flexible over the weekend or Monday, so you can do it anytime or night. I mean, whatever you want to do it, we can do part two. So well, you. you you just let me know. I'm already prepared. I've already got the stuff. You let me know. We'll do it. The next sections are going to be on the atonement and the investigative judgment, which yes, it will also encompass their blasphemous scapegoat doctrine. So we did today. We did it at seven year time. Yep. Seven year time. Uh, tomorrow, I'm trying to figure because someone I'm supposed to speak from your time seven eight thirty. I'm available nine your time tomorrow. If that's too late, we can do it weekend. You let nine me know. Nine p.m. Yeah, I can do nine p.m. tomorrow your time. Okay, let's do it. Oh, so you're good for nine. We're gonna do part two yeah. tomorrow, guys. Nine p.m. Nine p.m. That's ten p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Ten p.m. New York time. Ten p.m. Michigan time. God willing, send me another thumbnail. To try to yep. get, get make me look a little skinnier because I was heavier back then. Send me a picture. I just need a picture that I can cut you yeah, out of. Yeah. I got to see. Well, whatever thumbnail or even of you doesn't even have to be. So God willing, he'll send me a thumbnail. I'll set it up as soon as possible. We're going to do tomorrow part two because he hasn't even gone into the investigative judgment yet. You thought this was filthy and it is. Oh. Watch what they're going to do with Satan, how Satan plays a role in your salvation at the end. Correct. Okay. And so we'll and and the atonement, Sam. Wait, wait till you hear about the, their idea of the atonement. So repeat it again. So Satan has a role to play in saving and atoning. He has a role to play. They will say, obviously, no, no, no. The logical conclusions, though, because they use Leviticus 16, the Day of Atonement, as the type and the scapegoat very clearly based on uh, Leviticus 16.5 and 16.10. It's one singular offering that was both the Lord's goat and the scapegoat that made atonement, according to verse 10. They teach that the scapegoat typified not the Lord Jesus, Satan. Yes, Azaziel, yeah. So tomorrow, yeah. Godwin, we promise he's going to send thumbnail. Guys, I'm going to schedule it later today. You're going to see it. We had a good crowd. We had about 500. Thank you for loving Jesus enough to come here to listen to this and support this brother. Now you, close to 500, go to his channel, subscribe, eat up his stuff. Let's make it 600 tomorrow, God willing. We're going to do it 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Promise you part two. So we'll end it with that. Any final thoughts or prayer requests until tomorrow, God willing? Christians, you need to understand the dangers of this movement. This movement is bigger than Mormonism and Jehovah's Witnesses. We see entire ministries dedicated to Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, these other cults. But Adventists have taken the Walter Martin Pass because they were able to pull the wool over his eyes back when he was working on Kingdom of the Cults, and they knew the right language to use but did not define the terms. You can watch his discussion on the John Ankerberg Show with William Johnson, uh, back from the 80s. This was after Kingdom of the Cults came out and Walter realized they pulled the wool over his eyes and he realized this thing is from the pit of hell. 
So you yeah. need to understand this stuff because there are a lot of these people out there. This is sending millions of people to hell. They are well-meaning people, oftentimes just like Mormons, and they need the truth explained to them. You need to explain and share with them the true and living God, not this false tritheistic butchering that Ellen concocted off of who knows what. So eat this information up. The channel is specifically dedicated to Christians. It's not even specifically dedicated to Seventh-day Adventists. It is dedicated to a former Seventh-day Adventist seeking to help educate the wider body of Christ on this information. We can't all be experts in everything. This right. is the lane that I am in. So come check out the channel. I'll see you again tomorrow at nine o'clock, Sam. And I want to just add one final thing. It was because of Walter Martin's Kingdom of the Cults that I was deceived into thinking Seven day Adventists were legitimate. And for years, yep. so I'm just I'm confirming what he said. I have the kingdom of the cults in my library. I read a section on seven day Adventism and I trust it. And it, like he said, he didn't know either. He was being deceived. So I'm not blaming him. I trusted what he said. And for all this time, until about two years ago, when a former Adventist said a lot of things you said, <clears throat> but didn't have the time to go into depth, you did. I thought they were a legitimate. Protestant Trinitarian group. But now I never watched that part or I watched snippets of it. Walter Martin found out a little too late. He was hoodwinked. Yep. They are a dangerous satanic cult worse than Muslims. May God save the Adventists. And thank you, brother. So God willing, tomorrow, and remember Jesus is Lord and he lives and he is eternally equal to the Father and the Spirit. He was never Amen. made equal to the Father. Truly, fully God, one with the Father and the Spirit in essence. And we pray the true Jesus returns sooner than later. Lord willing, see you tomorrow, guys. Christ is risen, risen indeed. Take care.